I voiced in a Yaoi audiobook, the movie, the musical, the video game. Hi, so if you're listening to this, it means that You Are My Princess has been released, the audiobook has been released, and it was an audiobook that I was in as the main character, Itsumi Tachibana, produced by Connor, also known as Sea Dog on Twitter, and for Bookwalker, uh, for the manga, so that you could listen to it and follow along with the manga for best effect. Uh, and I thought that I would talk about it, the uh, the process of being cast, what it meant to play this role, um, and also, you know, getting into some, you know, armchair media analysis about it. Uh, but don't worry, it's going to be fun armchair media analysis. I'm sure I'm assuring you right now that you're going to have fun. But um, I am going to get into some spoilers for the manga throughout all of this. Um, I mean, as much as you can spoil a heartwarming, comedic, romantic comedy manga, but... So before you listen to this, I would like you to stop this recording right now. Go buy a copy of the audiobook and the manga, read it, enjoy it, come back, listen to this, and then after you're done listening to this, buy a couple more copies for your friends. And do remember to use the uh, make a new account and use the coupon code CDAWG, C D A W G, to make sure that Connor gets paid for all of his hard work. But we're going to start out with the prologue for this little fairy tale, the Once Upon a Time. Uh, last year kind of sucked for me, and I'm going to go into exactly why that was. And it's a little surprising to be saying that, considering the fact that this year is such a trash fire. But professionally speaking, last year was a weird year for me. Um, as a voice actor, and take this to heart, up-and-coming voice actors, uh, as a voice actor... It's basically a known fact that if you audition for 100 things, you're going to book maybe five of them. And, I mean, even if you're looking at, you know, people who book a lot, that's because they're auditioning for a lot. Like, they're auditioning for so many things that you don't realize about. And that's why you see them booking so much. It's just throwing things at the wall. It's like a shotgun, you know. You're sending out a lot of pellets, and a few of them are actually going to hit vital spots. But, that being said, I... Audition a lot for a lot of uh, gay stuff, um, mostly because uh, in, I mean, in the big leagues, the AAA stuff, you very rarely get gay roles to begin with. Um, and then even in the indie scene, where it's much more common, you still don't get a lot. So boys love visual novels and stuff like this audiobook, this Yaoi audiobook, are some of the few places where you can act I can actually find roles that I can sink my teeth into and feel like I am represented in. So I audition for a lot of this stuff. And of course, per the rules of how, you know, auditioning works, I don't get cast a lot in them. Um, and I also have a tendency, and this may just be confirmation bias or I may just be, you know, paranoid, but I feel like I have a tendency to a lot of times audition for roles that end up going to straight actors sometimes. And um, I'll get into that in a little bit. But I was just, just auditioning for things throughout the year. And, you know, it was just getting kind of disheartening to not get cast in some of this stuff. Although I did get cast in some things. I mean, I had a lot of fun in uh, the visual novel My Burning Heart last year by Ertl Games. Uh, I got to play the evil vizier who gets a surprisingly sweet epilogue with the main character. It's a kind of a secret route. That was a lot of fun. But near the end of the year, I auditioned for this project, and I really wanted to be in this project. I mean, really, really wanted to be. And, of course, I didn't get cast. And, I mean, the thing about not getting cast is there is a multitude of reasons. I mean, you could just not be, you could do everything right and just not be the voice that people were looking for. You could just not have the right take, not the right emotional read. There are a thousand things that have nothing to do with you as a person. It's just a matter of what the casting director is looking for. And in this case, I was probably just not what the casting director was looking for. But... It broke me. Like, it really, really broke me. And when I say broke me, I mean, when I, I, I got really angry, as, you know, my Italian, Scottish, Irish, German self is wont to do, and then I wasn't angry anymore, and then I was cooking dinner, and then something emotionally hit me, and I just basically curled up in a ball against the door of my laundry room and was sobbing my eyes out on the kitchen floor while dinner was bubbling away on a pan above the on the stove. <laughs> 
right next to me. I mean, I was crying super, super hard. And it wasn't funny. It's not funny at all in the moment. But looking back, it kind of is. And, I mean, my fiancé had to come over there. And he basically was saying, you know, no, you're you're valid. You're worth something. You're, you're going to be okay. And all of this just, like, trying to help me through this anxiety attack slash mental breakdown slash whatever it was. And after this, I actually ended up taking a little bit of an internet break. Um, I actually, uh, for a little while, created a side Twitter so I could kind of scope out some of the artists I like while not having to deal with the rest of anyone. Um, and during this time, I had a lot of time to think. And I sort of came to the realization that losing these roles out to straight actors was doing a pretty bad number on my self-worth as a queer man. Um, I basically realized that every time I lost out one of these roles to a straight man, I was internalizing it as you are not a good enough gay man. You are not valid enough in your gayness to play these roles. And not only are you not valid, these straight men are more valid than you are. And that was that was just doing really, really nasty things to me. And luckily, after realizing that, I was able to kind of recontextualize the way I reacted to things. I realized, oh, this is why this is happening to me. Now I can kind of stop letting my mind go to this place. Because sometimes you don't even realize that you're subconsciously doing this until you really sit down and think about it. And luckily, now it doesn't matter. I've auditioned for, you know, a few gay roles this year and have gotten, you know, some of them I've not cast in and I've had no five alarm mental meltdown. So I think I fixed that. Um, but one, 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 a couple of things right here. First of all, uh, aspiring voice actors listening to that, this, uh, that whole thing about melting down because you're not feeling that that is not healthy. That is not healthy in the slightest. Don't do that. And if you feel you're starting to do that, do that. Try to figure out some way to not do it because tying any part of your self worth to any of this is a really, really bad idea. Like I used to do it for all roles back when I was, you know, first starting out. I would take every audition that I lost really, 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 really to heart, and I stopped doing that. And I thought I was okay until this happened, and then this happened. I was like, okay, you need to stop doing that as well. So. Don't don't tie any part of your self-worth to auditioning because it will kill you. It will destroy you. Um, and as an addendum to that, no one is ever required to cast me for anything. This is not what this is about. No casting director is ever required to cast me to assuage <laughs> my self-worth issues. Like, please, God, don't do that. Cast whoever you need to. Cast whoever is best for the part. Uh, don't, don't, don't try to, you know, don't try to be my lorazepam. Uh, for those of you who don't know what lorazepam is, it's an anti-anxiety medication. That was a terrible mental health joke. Um, but saying all of that, there is something to be said about people doing better by representational casting. And people have been doing better about that. A lot of these things that I've auditioned for, um, they've actually done a really good job of getting in queer actors to play queer roles. Not all the time, but a lot of the times they have, which I do really like seeing. I think it's really important. Uh, and that's because I think there are there are parts of the gay of the uh, of the gay experience, of the queer experience that I think it's very difficult for straight actors to understand. There's there's flavors to the experience that it's just hard to grasp if you haven't lived that. And we're going to put a pin in that because I'm going to come back to it when I'm actually going into sort of story discussion about the uh, about the manga itself. But which is why I think it's very important and I've said as much on Twitter a couple of times during some rather heated arguments in the online VA community about representational casting about how I really think that there should be queer actors or at least someone queer involved in the storytelling process um although i will say that it's not a make or break thing for me i'm not going to cancel anyone like representational casting in the online voice community can be really really hard sometimes because you're looking at you know you've only got so much of a talent pool especially if you're starting out you might not even get that many people auditioning and so your choice there is to well should i just not do if i can't get anyone should i just 
not do this project or should I just go with what I have? And that that I completely understand. I completely 100% understand that. And really the only thing that I'll get, the only hill that I will die on as far as representational casting is that I really think that uh, person roles that are of color, person of color roles, I think those should really, really be played by the by the person of color who that role represents. I really do believe that. I think it's almost indefensible if it doesn't happen. And I also really think it's indefensible if trans characters are not being played by trans actors. Because those are the kinds of experiences that I think, especially when cishet, act, cishet and especially cishet white actors are playing those kinds of roles. I think they really just cannot understand what they're getting into as far as those, as those roles. I think you can do, I think any actor can do research and can definitely try to get to it, but I really think there's an element of the performance that is made much better and much more powerful, even if it's just something really, really dumb and silly, if it's, you know, if the role is being embodied by someone who's experienced that kind of thing. That is the one hill that I will die on. Everything else, I'm like, you have a gay white guy in your in your um, visual novel, you know what, sure, let let a straight white guy play. I mean, I mean y y it's your project. I'm not going to, I'm going to be, I'm going to, you know, narrow my eyes a little bit and go, eh, but I'm not, I'm not going to get that mad. It's really just trans and people of color who I'm like definitely definitely need to be represented but moving on from all of that uh, oh actually one last thing before I go and the other reason I get very kind of passionate about representational casting is like I said before there's not a lot of roles to fill when it comes to you know queer roles and like that and it's sometimes hard for queer actors to break into, you know, any kind of industry because, I mean, there's all of these well-established straight actors taking those roles from us. Like, that's why I don't think you should bar people from auditioning necessarily, but one thing I've seen oftentimes is that in casting calls, and excuse the burp right there, in casting calls, a lot of times I will see, um, you know, X people of X marginalized group are encouraged to audition. X people are encouraged to audition and that just sort of gives me a sign that they're really looking to try and fill those roles with X person from a marginalized group, which I really, really like. So, like, it's it's partially about, you know, giving these people a chance to tell these stories and it's also partially about just giving people the ability to try and get into an industry that really kind of treats us like shit sometimes, man. Like, uh, it's not so bad in the indie field, but oh God, does the professional field sometimes not treat queer actors well at all. But let's get away from sort of the doom and gloom here and uh, go into sort of the, the next part of this, which is just talking about the process of getting to be part of this project and, you know, auditioning, directing, all of that. Um, like I said, last year was bad. And I think uh, I saw the auditions for this posted on Twitter. And uh, being me, I left them till literally the last moment. And when I say the last moment, I think I may very well have sent the auditions in like 30 to 45 minutes before the deadline. It was really close. Um, and it's interesting because... Here's the thing. Well, I, I just spent all that time talking about representational casting and all that. I was not cast for this role because I was gay. I was, uh, as you can see in the video, <laughs> I was cast as uh, as this role because I'm really because. Well, let me put it like this: my untreated anxiety and depression make it really, really easy for me to sound like I'm crying on microphone. I guess the shitty, you know, American healthcare system has to be good for something. Um, and I think half the reason that I <laughs> did so well at sounding distraught on that third audition line was because it was late. I wanted to get the auditions in. I was doing It's a Me last, and <laughs> I was having problems with the word seriously in the audition because the line is, 
No, it's serious. It's the line was, I don't know if you're serious or not when you say you like me. And I was having so much trouble saying that word. And I was worried that, you know, not pronouncing that word right was going to get me in trouble and was going to cause me to not be cast. And I was just getting so, so upset over it that I think that might have bled into my performance on that line at some point. I think one or two of those takes were literally me, you know, in character trying to be upset, but but also the real Ryan being slightly upset because I can't get this gosh darn line right. But hey, it worked out. So um, I auditioned once again at the last minute, uh, sent in my auditions. And when I auditioned, here's usually how I do auditions. If there's a if there's a main if the main character is within my vocal range, I will usually always audition for the main character, whether I think I'm going to get it or not. Um, then I'll usually audition for as many supporting characters as can fit my range. And sometimes, if I'm feeling frisky, I'll try out a few that don't, just because you know sometimes I surprise myself, and I apparently surprise casting directors with the voices I can do. Um, and then I'll also audition for, you know, minor and small roles as well. And for this, I didn't have a lot of time, so I really only auditioned for three characters. Um, it's me, um, oh god, I just forgot his name. I'll loop back to that. Um, to, oh, Tetsu, Tetsu, his best friend Tetsu, who went to Patrick, who's absolutely amazing. Um, and the, sh the uh, shopkeeper, the guy who sort of runs the cat cafe where It's Me goes to. And to be quite truthful, when I was doing the auditions, I thought, you know, I'd be more likely to get either the shopkeeper or very, very possibly Tetsu. Like, I don't think I was even considered for Tetsu, and it was probably for the best, considering what kind of voice he was looking for. Um and, of course, after this, I uh, – Connor eventually started talking about, you know, d listening to the auditions and trying to get access into Gmail, which was being a bitch to him. And I was, you know, the longer this went on, I was like, you know, you know, know what? I'm probably not even going to get cast as any of them. Maybe the shopkeeper. Maybe. And then, um, lo and behold, that Thursday, um, I uh, got a message from Connor on Twitter saying that I was – I had booked the role of It's Me. And I was so shocked and just a sudden adrenaline spike that I literally had to walk away from the couch where my computer was and lay down on the floor for a moment to let the feelings wash over me because it was just insane. I mean, this is this is quite literally the first lead character I've ever voiced in something that wasn't either fan work, was just incidental lines, so maybe five or six li five or six like lines and a couple of effort noises or just never really got off the ground this is my first real main character that I'd ever booked and it was super super exciting for me and it actually meant a lot to me to get to play this because like I said I've been I'd been really down on myself last year because you know I was like yeah I'm not getting cast in anything it means I'm not a good enough gay man and while I have gotten over that it did feel as a nice Sometimes you just have these roles that you get that kind of – it just feels nice to book them after you've had a shitty time. And it was just like, oh, God, yes, I get to play a gay character. I get to play a gay main character. And not only that, he was – the character of Itsumi is very much outside of my normal type – my normal typecasting. Like, normally I usually get these – very suave characters who use my lower register. So getting to use this character who actually was a little bit closer to my normal speaking voice was kind of, and not only that, but just so far off from these normally stoic characters I play. Like he shouts, he gets angry, he goes really over the top and gets cartoony with his reactions. It was just so much fun, especially because I was actually talking to a friend of mine, um, I think, two or three weeks before I auditioned for this about how I was beginning to get scared that the fact that I kept getting cast as these stoic characters meant that I just wasn't a good actor. Like, that was this, that was seriously something that was starting to worry me. And so getting to play this character who goes to these different extremes and also gets to play these very, very intense emotions was just very, very validating. So uh, I, got the, I got the message that I got cast. Um... That was on a Thursday. Uh, we did the first cons the first recording session on Friday and the second recording session on Saturday, and it was four hours of the most fun I've ever had. Connor is an absolutely fantastic director. I think 80% of the time was actually going through the lines, and 20% of it was just shooting the shit. It was, it was absolutely the most fun I've had. Connor was great. Um, 
in sort of pulling me into these emotional moments, which was actually really easy. But I think what his direction really helped with the most was getting to me, getting me to some of these really high comedic points and these very energetic shouting points, because that's one thing that I was worried about going into this, because it's not something I normally do. And he really, really helped me get to that. Um, and then, of course, the second session was great because we opened with uh, we opened with all of the really intense stuff in chapter three and just banged it out of the park. I even made a joke at the end of that, like, well, we got the easy stuff done. Now all the hard stuff. Now all the hard stuff where I have to be, you know, all shonen and shit. Um, but we got done with that. Um, although we had this very brief scare because you'll notice in the uh, in the video in the documentary where uh, he just turns to the camera and is like uh, his his computer just crashed so I'm a little bit worried and it was in the middle of recording sort of the dialogue for the sex scene at the end but luckily I had taken a bathroom break right before we started recording that so I'd actually stopped my recording software and because of that we saved a lot of work I just had to go back on my own and record the lines for the sex scene um, because we ended up recording, like, the very end of the manga after that because, you know, that's the stuff he needed to be really be there to direct me for. Um, then the next couple of days were a bit of a nightmare because it was me cutting down two, three-and-a-half-hour recording sessions to just, excuse me, be my voice. And it was incredibly dull and tedious, and I think I watched a lot of Netflix and Hulu during that. But I got it done, and it was really funny because it was like two, three and a half hour sessions that ended up being like 35 to 40 minute, you know, audio files that I then sent to Connor. Um, he listened over them, sent them to, you know, be edited. We actually, I was super worried that we'd have to do a lot of retakes, but we actually only had to do a few. Um, a couple were just because my audio had peaked beyond where it could really be worked with. Um, a couple were uh, missed lines, and I think one or two may have just been we needed a slightly different read on it. I can't really remember. I feel like it was mostly just missed lines and a couple of peaks. Um, and then it was really honestly just a waiting game in between um, uh, February and um, April 10th when it was – well, 9th when it was released – um, that was, you know, really hard because I really wanted to tell people about this. I really, I, I was, I've been so excited. I did a lot of vague posting on Twitter um, to the uh, point where uh, one of my friends actually thought I was in the Final Fantasy VII remake, which, I mean, they're both coming out at around the same time, so I understand that, but I'm not an L.A. actor, nor am I anywhere near that well-established. So, I mean, I'm, I'm flattered that he thought that, but, mm. <laughs> I oh God, I wish. Um, and then, of course, the day finally came, and I got to announce it, and it was absolutely, absolutely fantastic to, you know, get have that out there and to, you know, know that people were listening to it and were really enjoying it. Uh, although, I think one of my favorite compliments so far is that someone was like, you bottomed like a champ and I was like thanks because uh, you know honestly I was kind of excited to finally get to play a bottom for once um but it was just it was just an absolutely amazing experience um Connor was an absolutely fantastic director and his voice work as Takajo the other love interest is absolutely amazing like he switches from this very over the top hilarious character to like this very quiet calm stoicness and he even gets a couple of moments where he's just absolutely angry and one moment where he's just incredibly emotionally distraught and I think his moments of this almost cartoonishy over the topness and this very smooth stoicness make those two moments of immense of intense emotion just pop that much more and of course the rest of the cast is fantastic Patrick Mealy is oh my god amazing as Tetsu um Brandon McKinnis is Mizuki. Wow. He's so incredibly hateable, and I love it. And all of the other people who played minor roles, like a lot of whom are friends of mine in the VA community and colleagues who I really like. It's just everyone did such a good job, and I'm so proud to be part of it. Um, and that's just really all about the process. Um, now what I'd really like to talk to for the rest of this is just to talk about the manga itself because, I mean, I've spent all this time talking about how much fun it was to be part of and now I – going into this, I wasn't originally going to talk about this. I was originally just going to talk about the process. But something kind of caught my interest, and now I just kind of really want to talk about the story itself. So what I'll sort of start off – and I'm actually sort of bringing up my notes because 
Uh, I actually need notes for this part. What I really liked about this going in once I had read it is that, first of all, it avoids a lot of sort of the tropes that are sort of most well-known with yaoi manga. Like, normally you have the masculine, sort of very dominating, almost predatory uh, top, and the sort of very feminized, weepy, kind of almost scared bottom. Um, and it's it's kind of this very strange power dynamic where the top is almost forcing themselves on the bottom. And you also get a lot of this whole, well, I can't like guys, I'm straight. And then just suddenly he's, you know, taking dick like a champ. Um, there's not really a lot of that in here. It's very non-trophy. Um, I think in a more, and this is something that's been happening a lot in this kind of manga. They've been very much getting away from these kind of worrisome tropes. Um, I mean, not that there's anything wrong with liking those worrisome tropes. I like them. I, I like my trash sometimes. Sometimes I just have trash that I like. But um, in this one, uh, Itsumi is very much, just in terms of demeanor and his character design, very much would normally be considered sort of the top character because he's, when you get to the sex scene, you notice that he's definitely drawn as a little bit more muscular than Takajo. He's much more energetic. He's loud. He's abrasive. Um, while Takajo is, in general, a little more demure, he's much more bishy, he's prettier, um, but in the end, Takajo is actually the one doing a lot of the pursuing, and Itsumi is the one who's kind of, the one kind of like, oh, I don't know if I'm, uh, well, maybe I am interested, and then, of course, at the end, he's the one who bottoms, um, but I really, really like that, and I think both of them are very attractive, um, especially my character Itsumi. He's he's great. Arr. And I really like that it's just this very cute and heartwarming story. Like it's really absolutely adorable. I I love I love these guys. I, I wanted them I wanted them together by the end of it. I was I was rooting for them so much. And the art's really good. The art is really, really good. Like I'm not I'm not saying that it's, you know, an artistic masterpiece, but it's it's very, very good. Like, I really like the artwork. I like a lot of the panel composition. They There was this one moment where they do this thing where Itsumi is saying something and his eyes are hidden from view in the panel. And it was just this... I mean, it's a, it's very much an anime manga trope, but it was very evocative. And it really helped me get into the emotions of the line sometimes. I would oftentimes tell Connor when I was getting ready to record something, you know, I got to take a look at the manga and see what the first face journey is before I go through these lines. So I really, really like the art. But what really got me thinking about... Um, what, what got me thinking about this from sort of an analysis perspective was uh, at one point I was reading through the manga and without saying why I was reading it, I shared one panel with a couple of gay friends of mine on Discord. Uh, it, was, it was from the last chapter. It's just this panel where Takajo, I think, has just asked Itsumi to have sex with him or told him that he wants to have sex with him. And he kind of, the panel is Itsumi kind of looking away and down and blushing intensely. And like, I was just like, oh my God, I love that panel. It's so emotionally evocative. And a friend of mine was like, oh, it's like, you know, he wants it, but he doesn't know if he has permission to want it. And I just, it, it clicked this thought in my head this thought and this sort of thesis statement came out of my head and I actually posted this on Twitter a long long time ago of just like in heterosexual romance stories the central tension the central conflict is I can't believe someone like you would like me while in queer romance stories the central tension the central conflict or inner conflict is I can't believe I'm being allowed to like you and I think it was that moment, it was that panel and that thought coming to me that made me kind of want to look at this in terms of an analysis perspective. And keep in mind, I'm aware, this is just a silly, funny, heartwarming, you know, down-to-earth, mildly tropey romance comedy manga. Like, there's nothing super groundbreaking about it. But as one of my favorite YouTubers has proven, and I'm not going to name names because I don't want to feel like I'm reaching for cloud here, um, anything... Anything can, you can find parallels, you can find emotional resonance in anything. And so 
what I'm talking about here is just sort of the parallels and the emotional resonance that I kind of found in this manga. But we can really start from the beginning because the manga in many, way, in many ways is about two sort of parallel character journeys, about two characters who are opening up together. And we start off, of course, with of course with Itsumi, our protagonist, our viewpoint character, and he is sort of considered to be the school delinquent. He's very rough, very abrasive, and due to him kind of getting in this mild altercation in the past, people think he's dangerous and scary when really he's just kind of rough and also has orange hair, which is kind of a delinquent thing in Japan. Um, but he has this secret. He really, really likes cute things. He visits a cat cafe in his off time to kind of recharge his batteries. He likes cute stories. When we get a shot of his bedroom later, we see he has all of these plush animals. And I talked to Connor about this during our second session about how this wasn't really a story about um, a guy coming to terms with his sexuality. It was about a guy coming to terms with the idea that he could be loved by another and while this isn't really there's not really anything about homophobia or coming to terms with the sexuality there is this interesting parallel in the way that um Itsumi's love of cute things is this part of him that he's scared about people finding out he's scared about sharing in surprisingly the same way that I as a gay man am really scared was really scared when I was first coming out to share the fact that I was gay with people because I was worried about what they would think I was worried they would think I was silly stupid or whatever and so it's me's journey throughout all of this is slowly opening up that part of himself to Takajo it's him allowing Takajo to know that and in fact as we find out later it's very much that thing that's what that is what caused Takajo to fall in love with him. Um, it's that fact that he just lights up around cute things that kind of first set the buzz into Takajo's heart. But it is it is sort of a long process. Um, and it's exacerbated by the fact that this whole thing about ta about not Takajo, about it's me being worried about people knowing that he likes cute things and knowing that they're going to kind of think he's weird for that bleeds into sort of why he's so ambivalent towards Takajo's affections at first. Because Takajo is very over the top about how much he wants Itsumi. He's always, you know, being like, Itsumi! And I love you, my princess, my Cinderella! And at no point is it really him being worried about it from a perspective of his own masculinity, except for maybe one sort of throwaway line at, at a certain point. It's more that he thinks that Takajo is making fun of him. He thinks all of this is just a joke that Takajo is playing on him because he doesn't believe that Takajo could really love him. He doesn't believe that any of this could be happening to him. And this all ends up kind of coming... And this this idea of his that Takajo is just making fun of him gets slowly ground down as he sort of interacts with Takajo, as he as they talk at the cat cafe, as Takajo, as Takajo shares some of his anxieties with him, as they share this really sweet moment on the uh, roof of the school. And it all starts sort of grinding away at his assumption that Takajo is doing this to make fun of him and also results in him sort of slowly coming to realize that, you know, he kind of cherishes Takajo as well. And it all kind of comes to a head in story three when Mizuki, another member of the student council, has up until this point in during chapter two been like playing all of these kind of mean pranks on him this entire time because he doesn't want because it's not st stated exactly but it's pretty obvious that Mizuki has a little bit of a thing for Takajo and he's angry that Itsumi is taking this attention away from him a little bit of a, a proto yandere moment here and he basically tells Itsumi in chapter three as he's tormenting him that that's the only reason that Takajo picked him, that he's just playing games, that he found another toy to play with. And Itsumi, interestingly enough, immediately accepts this. And there's nothing really specifically stated as to why, but there's this mild subtext that for whatever reason, be it because he thinks he's weird because he likes cute things or because he's internalized this loathing, this kind of base self-loathing from the way people ostracize him, he immediately believes that he is not worthy enough of love 
for Takajo to be serious. He immediately accepts that what Mizuki says, that Takajo is just playing around. Um, and it was really an interesting thing to kind of play with, just this moment of kind of anger and then despair. And then, of course, Takajo comes up and he chases the student council people away in this moment where in the only moment we see where he just shows flat out anger. And it's me confronts him about how he just does not know whether or not Takajo is being serious. And, of course, Takajo explains that he is being serious. And once it's me realizes that, then he's like, yes, please treat me as your princess. You're, I want to be with you. And they kiss. And after that, they are officially dating. Um, and it's that it's interesting because after that, um, the next chapter, sort of the one that focuses on the school festival has this other moment that just was so evocative of the experience. Just this moment where throughout the, uh, throughout this chapter, Takajo is kind of ghosting it to me. Like it's clear that they're still texting very affectionately, but Takajo is acting weirdly non-affectionate up until he kind of grabs him at the school festival and pulls him into a classroom so they can have some time together. And this kind of reflects on the way that Takajo mm, Takajo it's me. Gosh, darn it. I'm just going to keep getting them mixed up. It's me doesn't believe that he's loved because he doesn't really fight back against it that much. He just kind of lets it happen and kind of accepts it up until this moment when uh, when they're alone together in this classroom during the festival, when he just kind of explodes thinking that, you know, he says, was it me? Was it only me who was looking forward to this? And Takajo explodes back. And I'll go into Takajo's in a second when I'm done talking about It's Me and I can get to him. Um and it's just such a wonderful experience because I know that experience that way that, you know, you fall in love with someone as a man and like falling in love with someone as a man, like being gay. There's like this whole double unlock process when, when you're trying to date someone, because first you have to find out if they're even interested in you. Second, you well, first of all, let me let me backtrack. First, you have to find out if they're interested in men. Second, you have to find out if they're interested in you specifically as a man. So. This just moment of, you know, I know he loves me, but does he really? <laughs> does he really? And that was just so evocative right there. But they do, of course, you know, affirm that they're in love with each other. And then the chapter after that is just this very adorable chapter where they go on a date and then go back to Takashi's house and then they bang. And which leads up to that that moment of it's me getting that look on his face that embarrassed. I want to have sex with him, but can I? Um, and it's just that that face is just absolutely branded in my mind because I love it so much. Just that because most of the time in this manga, actually, that whole thesis I said about, you know, am I allowed to love him doesn't really come up. But this is really the moment that encapsulates it. This final moment where it's like where it's me is like, am I really allowed to do this? Like, is this OK? And he says yes. And they have sex and I'll get to the sex scene in a bit but let's go back to Takajo so in parallel with Itsumi's character development Takajo has his own character development that's sort of a little bit off screen but not really because while Itsumi is slowly coming to terms with and allowing Takajo to accept that you know he likes cute things and does like being treated like a princess Takajo is kind of coming at this from he's got this image as the school prince and he's perfect and he's well liked and he's dependable and what he kind of shows it's to me is this idea that all of this pressure does weigh on him that you know sometimes it's very hard to live up to all, to all of this and it's also interesting because he is the first person to kind of let this side of himself show intentionally because Itsumi has let this side of himself show to Takajo accidentally, but Itsumi is the one actually sort of letting this show intentionally, almost as a way of kind of coaxing Itsumi out of his shell. And it just sort of continues throughout as, you know, Takajo showing this cell, showing this part of himself to Itsumi. And for a moment, I thought that was it, that that was what he the side of himself that he was showing to Itsumi, that Takajo was just being like, you know, I'm not as perfect as everyone thinks. 
then, and here is where I'm going to talk about the sex scene. Um, I figured out that there was another side of Takajo that Takajo was allowing himself to show to someone because me and Connor kind of joked a lot about how the sex scene at the end kind of comes out of nowhere and is mostly there because it's a yaoi manga and they need to have that sex scene. They need to have that moment where everyone can be like, ooh, that is so spicy. But thinking about all this, I realized that the sex scene is does serve a narrative purpose because part of showing Itsumi that he's not the perfect school president, school prince that everyone thinks he is, is showing Itsumi that he is a really thirsty little motherfucker. <laughs> like, oh my god. He wants Itsumi so bad. And it's that that he's showing Itsumi that is sort of the deepest part of Takajo that Takajo is showing to Itsumi. It's his it's him laying the deepest part of himself bare. So in that way, in that way, the sex scene is kind of narratively important because it is it is Itsumi accepting this part of Takajo, accepting it as normal and it, and also accepting it as really something that he does want from Takajo. And in that way, I think it's, you know, really important. I don't think the sex scene may... I, I mean, the sex scene maybe could have just been done in a few panels of just this very kind of evocative stuff and then just gone to the end. But, you know, at the same time, you have to have your, you know, your pound of smut. So I don't mind that. Um, and there's some interesting other moments, too. There's uh, a moment early on when... Um, they're at the cat cafe and it's sort of the first time they're talking and Takajo is kind of helping Itsumi get acquainted with this cat who Itsumi has been having some trouble with and he talks about how you you know you have to let the cat come to you you have to get low to the ground make yourself non-threatening and let the cat come to you and it's interesting because in the story in the manga Itsumi doesn't really start warming up to Takajo until Takajo kind of stops being as over the top and comical with his love confessions and does kind of bring himself down to his level. Itsumi starts falling in love with Takajo when Takajo just kind of starts giving him these quiet moments where he talks to Itsumi about his anxieties, about the pressure, about all this stuff. It's in these quiet moments when Itsumi really starts to fall for him. So I think there's an interesting narrative parallel there where, you know, at the very beginning of the story, Takajo is talking about how you can lure, how you become friends with a cat. And that ends up being sort of what he does to get Itsumi to fall in love with him. And I also really, really like the scene at the festival because it's just basically Takajo says that the reason that he's kind of been ghosting Itsumi in public is that, you know, he just wants so badly to hold him and kiss him and be with him, but he doesn't know how. He's just never been with someone he liked before. And more than that, he's just worried about, you know, whether or not that would make Itsumi hate him because Itsumi has, for a good part of this, just reacted very poorly to all the ways that Takajo has shown his affection. And that just, that actually kind of hurts because that's just so true of the queer experience. Just like, you know, not knowing how to be with someone you like because, you know, up until the last maybe decade, there's not been a whole lot in pop culture that really tells us, you know, how are we supposed to be romantic to people with the same sex? I mean, we got all these heterosexual couples. How are we supposed to do this shit? And, you know... Not only that, but just this almost moment of internalized, you know, fear of himself, just this fear of his own affection, affection that has come from the way Itsumi has been treating him. And it's just I mean, I myself just when I was coming out, I had to deal with so much internalized homophobia from when I was in high school and like. It was the mid-2000s. Gay was the chosen insult for every straight boy on the playground. Um, and I just was so scared of, you know, proving, although I had, I had internalized that being gay was a bad thing so much that I was scared of letting myself be gay and proving all those people who had insulted me right. And that just, the way that Takajo is just so scared that Itsumi is going to hate him for being a affectionate is just I mean I know this is a silly little manga but that moment was kind of powerful for me just a little bit just a bit 
but uh, like man that's actually what i was kind of talking about earlier and let's pull that pin out about um you know queer actors are better able to sort of understand that queer experience because until you've lived those moments of you know the internalized self-loathing the fear of hiding yourself the fear of hiding what or who you like it's really really hard to kind of latch on to that even if like in this case it's not really a specific moment of that but really just something that kind of parallels or serves as an emotional touchstone to that experience it is so hard if you haven't lived that to really draw on that kind of thing to then put it out there in your acting and that is why i think it's so important to at least attempt at representational casting um but i mean that's really all i have to say about that like the manga is really good um the audiobook is really really good i i've listened to it i love it um and i also made my fiance listen to the sex scene at the end and he made some absolutely great faces and pulled out some fantastic reaction gifts but please please support the release um buy it from bookwalker make sure to make a new account and use the coupon code cdog to ensure that connor gets paid for it um comment go to his twitter um at cdog va uh, and just tell him what a good job he did. Uh, if you would like to hear more of my ramblings, come on over to um, Hoyle Ryan on Twitter, uh, at Hoyle Ryan, um, and just follow me there, or don't. I don't care. I don't care. Um, and please, um, I'll also be including a link to uh, Connor's documentary down in the description. Please go watch that. It's absolutely fantastic and hilarious. Uh, when he got to the part where he was casting, like, I knew that I was it to me, Tachibana, because I'd already recorded the lines. But I was sitting there biting my nails waiting to see, am I going to get cast? Is he going to cast me? And also, he has links in the video to all of the people who worked on it, the editors, the video editors, and all of the absolutely brilliant voice actors. Please go follow, support every single one of them. Um because they're all amazing and some of them need much much more more love some of them need all of the love in the world um and that's really it i love you all stay beautiful and i hope you have a fantastic week